Yesterday, I was clearly having some problems, saying proper sentences. So let me review. Hopefully, I can say it right today. The situation that we had before was a constant vector field flowing through an area. The first thing that we noticed was that the shape of the area wasn't relevant because we have we had the area was 16 centimeters squared. That could be a square pipe. It could be a rectangular pipe squared, or it could be a circle with a radius of 16, uh, with an area of 16 square centimeters. The point is that the vector field is flowing perpendicular to the surface, and the flux is going to be the dot product of the vector field and the area as a vector. To represent the orientation of the surface, we choose a normal unit vector. The reason that we choose a unit vector is so that all the magnitude comes from the area itself, not from the vector. That way, when we calculate the dot product, we have the magnitude of V times the magnitude of N times the cosine of the angle between them and the area and times the area. So the flux is going to be five centimeters per second times the area 16 or in this case 80 cubic centimeters uh, per second. I don't even know if that's a lot. When we angle the, uh, the surface, when we angle the surface, we create more area, but less of the vector, less of the vector field is flowing perpendicular to the area. So when we angle the surface, The vector field isn't changing, but the vector normal to the surface is changing. Once again, I'm going to draw a unit vector perpendicular to the surface. So the area has increased, but the component of the vector field perpendicular to the surface has decreased. So by angling, the area increased. but the component of the vector field in the direction perpendicular to the surface has decreased.
So the n component of the vector field is the magnitude of the vector multiplied by the cosine of the angle between the vector field and the normal vector. So the area has increased by the cosine of whatever has by uh, the secant of the angle, but the vector has decreased by the cosine of that angle. So our flux is going to be five times the cosine of theta multiplied by the area, which is 16 divided by the cosine of theta. And so we end up with, once again, 80 cubic centimeters per second. This is what we wanted to happen because just because I changed the angle that that surface is, that shouldn't change how much water is flowing through this pipe if we're thinking about water flowing through the pipe. It doesn't matter if we're looking at it vertically through 16 square centimeters or at an angle of theta through 16 over the cosine of theta square centimeters because we're measuring the amount of the vector field going perpendicular to the surface. So the area has increased but the vector field has decreased by the same factor. We multiply by the cosine of theta, which is less than one, so it's not smaller. And the area we divide by the cosine of theta, which is less than one, so it got larger. So the vector decreased, but the area increased by the same factor. If we keep following this around like we should to the natural conclusion of things, if I start to flatten this area more, that's just going to increase the area with the angle because so that area gets longer and longer and longer until theta gets to 90, at which point we're dividing by the cosine of 90, which is zero. So at that point, we can't actually calculate the area. But at that point, the vector field is flowing right along the surface, not flowing through the surface at all. That section of the pipe is not going to be going across the whole pipe. It's just going to be running parallel through the pipe. The vector field is flowing parallel to the surface. And so the flux will be zero because it's no longer flowing through the surface. Right up until that surface goes flat, we have 80 cubic centimeters per second. But once that surface goes flat, the vector field is no longer flowing through the surface. The vector field is parallel to the surface. And so the flux is zero. In this case, our infinite area multiplied by our zero velocity comes out to zero. Sometimes zero times infinity is zero. That's an incredibly way to uh, an incredibly sketchy way to phrase it, 
but we're in calc three, so we can say sketchy things like this time is going to be multiplied by zero. Any questions? This is what we were. I was trying to talk about yesterday, and it was coming out weird. I reviewed the tape, and it was coming out weird. So I just thought I could do this. Did I talk about the Monty Hall problem yesterday? Okay. So has anybody heard of the Monty Hall problem? No, it's not the Monty Python problem. That's much more absurd. All right, this comes up every once in a while because social media does this. Every once in a while, this problem comes up and people express bad opinions. And I want to make sure that you're on the right side of history or on the right side of mathematics in this case. The Monty Hall problem is, uh, is related to the game show The Price is Right. Is anybody familiar with the game show The Price is Right? Yeah. Yeah, so in The Price is Right, there is a, a game where there are three doors. Behind one door is a fabulous prize, behind the other two doors are non-prizes. So that's the important part. Usually it says there's a brand new car behind one door and there's a goat behind the other two doors. This is gonna be completely ineffective, let's say against my wife, who would be disappointed in winning a brand new car, mostly because it'd be like a base model compact sedan and that's not what she's interested in. And if there is an opportunity to win a goat, she will absolutely bring a goat home. So we can't be having a goat in the house. So let's just say there's a fabulous prize, whatever you think that might be, behind one of the doors. Behind the other two doors is a non-prize. You get nothing. Good day, sir. This is how they play the game. You pick one of the three doors behind which you think is the prize. Then I say, I'm gonna show you what's behind one of the doors you didn't pick. And that will always reveal a non-prize. Whatever door you pick, I pick another one and I always pick one that does not show the prize. So you pick door number one, and I know that behind door number two is a goat and behind door number three is something else. I pick a door that you did not pick that has a non-prize behind it. Understand the game? So I show you what's behind door number one. So you didn't pick door number two. Or I show you what's behind a door that you didn't pick that has a non-prize. Then I off make the offer. Would you like to switch to the door you didn't pick or would you like to stay with the door that you did? And then the question, it's a question of probability. Anytime there's a question of probability, you have to understand humans are horrible at, develop, at intuition on probability. Your probability on into, uh, your intuition on probability is trash. Your intuition on probability is trash. If you're just basing your thoughts on probability on how you think things should go, you are probably wrong. Most likely wrong. But anyway, the question is now, I've shown you what's behind this door. What's the probability that switching produces a win? The probability is two thirds. Most people say that the probability is 50-50 because they're just looking at two doors, one of which has the prize. But that is not the problem. The problem started all the way back at the beginning when you picked a door. When you picked a door, one way you were right, two ways you were wrong. By switching, you're moving from the one that you picked wrong to one that you picked right. You have more information. It was one third that you were right before. 
switching is two thirds right. Now this does not mean that is an individual strategy, but this is what you should do. This just means if everybody goes into that game and applies the strategy of switching, two thirds of them will win. You might be one of the unfortunate losers, but that's the important thing to note. You're playing the game with more information. It was a win, a loss, and a loss. It could be a loss, a win, and a loss. It could be a loss, a loss, and a win. Let's say for the purposes of the argument, you always pick door number one. Because it doesn't matter. We could just translate this over, shift everything around. In that first case, if you happen to win when you started, switching is a loss. Oops. Now notice what I reveal in the first one, I'll reveal one of them, it doesn't matter. But switching is a loss. You pick door number one, I know the prize is behind door number two, you did not pick three, I'm like, oh, let me show you what's behind door number three. And you're like, oh, it was not a prize. But if you switch, it's a win. If the prize is behind three, then I say, oh, let me show you what's behind door number two. Oh, look at that. It's not the prize because it never is the prize. That would be really fucked up though. So just be like, oh, now uh, you were wrong. That's it, you were wrong. In the three possibilities, switch it, two of them, you get a win when you switch. The game did not start with pick one of these two doors. Fun background to this. Um, this was originally observed. Someone originally made this observation um, and, and said, check it out. The probability switching means the probability that you win is two thirds. And the author of that article was 100% absolutely savaged by people that disagreed with this. By, by the way, the people that disagreed with this and saying it was one half, they were absolutely savage and they were absolutely wrong. They weren't just disagreeing. We're not just gonna agree to disagree. They were wrong and they were exceptionally savage to the person. Now I'll give you one chance to guess the gender of the person that wrote the original article. And I bet if they had done this under a pen name with a man's name, it would have been a little more civil. This has happened a long time ago, although I bet the same thing would fucking happen today. Because in all the progress that we've made, it's still not enough. Let me check my watch. Nope, it's not. It's still kind of a fucked up society. But I would contend that the level of meanness that was directed at the author was amplified by their gender. But anyway, awesome problem. It comes up every now and then. I want you to be well informed. Anyone that says it's 50 50 is 100% wrong. And they're not taking into account the entire way. Don't be mean to them, just kind of pity them. If they start being a dick to you, if they start calling you stupid, you say, ah, I accept your defeat. I accept your surrender. Since you're attacking me, it's in front of me. You clearly cannot refute my arguments. You know what I mean? Here's another one that comes up from time to time. And let's let's head this off at the pass. 0.9 repeating is exactly equal to one. There is no difference. 0.9 repeating is equal to one. There is no question about this. If you disagree, you are just wrong. There's no agree to disagree here. There's no matter of opinion. The difference between one and 0.9 repeating is zero. And anybody that disagrees doesn't understand how infinity works. They just don't see how many nines there are. You know what I mean? There's nothing between these two numbers. If you're gonna write 0.9 repeating, just write one. If you wanna fuck with people, 
Instead of writing one, just write point nine two. Or two point nine repeating if you want to write three. Any questions? That's not equal to one. That's no, it's not that. No, it's not that. Don't even accept any other argument. And anybody that asks you to convince ask you to convince them, don't bother. They can't be convinced. If they still believe this today, they cannot be convinced. They have refused to be convinced. As evidence, I present flat earthers. Do not, do not ever engage with a flat earther. They have decided that they will not be convinced. That is the great danger of that position. They have decided that nothing will convince them. That's a level of fanaticism that should be shunned and feared. Never enter into a discussion with someone who has decided that they cannot be convinced otherwise. It matters of like factual things. You know what I mean? Factual demonstrable things. All right, tomorrow is a flex day, so there are no classes. I'll be in my office as normal on Friday. Um, so I'll just be sitting in my office on Zoom. Pop into the Zoom, if there's a sign that says coffee acquisition in progress, I'll be back and just, just wait. Um, if there is no sign and you log in and no one responds, just say something out loud and I'll hear that you're there. But I'm not, because I'm not always looking at the screen. Anyway, that's going to do it for today. That's going to do it for this week. I will see y'all on Monday. Everybody have a good weekend and thanks for playing.